All eyes are on Washington, D.C. today as Team Trump begins its transition to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And joining us now from the North Lawn at that very address, we have White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest. Josh, great to see you. Sorry we couldn't stop by and say hi when we were down there today. Um, I'm sorry I missed you. Uh, you are actually the closest thing to a, to a, a fly on the wall. Um, give us uh, your readout of, I know you've done this for, for others, but give us your readout of the meeting. Well, listen, the, uh, the, the president described it as a, as a positive, productive meeting. And the reason is that he heard uh, from the president-elect in private what, I, you know, what you guys all heard from the president-elect in public, which is that he struck a constructive tone uh, and a tone, that a tone that demonstrated his commitment to actually pursuing a constructive, effective, peaceful transition of power. Uh, this administration has actually been preparing for months for this transition of power. Uh, president Obama is committed to making sure that the next president can hit the ground running. Uh, I don't think he expected that he'd be working with uh, the president-elect uh, Trump's team, but that's who he's working with, and uh, we're committed to making sure that that transition is effective uh, in spite of the significant differences between the two men. Josh, you said something today that surprised me. You were asked about President Obama's comments during the campaign about Donald Trump being unqualified, and rather than saying what I would expect you to say, the campaign's over, we're moving forward, you said, yeah, he's, basically you said he still thinks that. Why, why well, did I don't want to leave people... Well, mostly because I don't want people to be left with the impression that somehow that was just empty rhetoric and that was a slogan and the president didn't really believe it. The president was making a forceful case based on his actual views during the campaign in support of, the, of Secretary Clinton, uh, who is his preferred candidate. Uh, it didn't work out. And elections have consequences. You know, I, I, I know that shortly after he took office, President Obama was quoted rather derisively by a bunch of Republicans saying, I can't believe how arrogant and pompous he was to say that elections have consequences. Uh, well, elections do have consequences, and I'm prepared to say it even when the election doesn't turn out the way that we hoped it would. Uh, elections do have consequences, and the president's committed to ensuring uh, a peaceful transition. That doesn't mean that he agrees with Donald Trump. It doesn't mean that all the concerns that he raised no longer apply. Of course they do. But the time for the argument uh, has passed. The American people have decided, uh, and elections have consequences. So, Josh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a, a question here, just to kind of kind of answer this in as best you can in a human way. The kind of like that grows out of Mark's question. You know, we've had a lot of you get a lot of criticism in presidential campaigns, but what President Obama said about Donald Trump repeatedly was that he was just unsuited to to be president of the United States, unfit to to be given the nuclear codes, right? And now he's sitting across from him effectively saying, I'm going to have to hand you the nuclear codes. So how does, in his mind, how does President Obama resolve that conundrum and feel okay with it? I understand he's committed to the peaceful transition of power. I get that he right. respects democratic norms. But what's he thinking in that moment? Uh, he's thinking that he has a responsibility that every president does, which is to put aside his own personal, deeply held political views and put the interests of the country and our democracy first. Uh, the good news is he's not the first president who's been in the situation who's had to do that. In fact, the last two presidents have had to do that. Uh, president Clinton, after serving for eight years, had to hand the keys to the Oval Office to uh, then President-elect George W. Bush, right. who had basically run around the country promising to restore honor and integrity to the Oval Office. Uh, not so implicit criticism of President Clinton, but yet President Clinton tried to fulfill his constitutional responsibilities. Governor George, or President George W. Bush did the same thing for President-elect Obama. President-elect Obama on the campaign trail was harshly critical uh, of the previous administration, but that uh, President Bush did not allow his personal peak or his disagreements with then the president-elect Obama to affect his ability to preside over a very effective, successful transition. President Obama is uh, committed to doing the same thing. And yes, that does require him to set aside his own personal views. But uh, when it comes to the functioning of our democracy, even the president of the United States has to set aside his own personal views to ensure the success of our country. Josh, in just a few weeks, you'll be signing a giant network TV political analyst contract, I assume. So let's, let's audition right now. Why did Hillary Clinton lose? Well, uh, here's the, uh, I think it's going to take a while to figure that out precisely. Let's take, your first, of, let's take your first blush at it. Because, you know, when you're, well, a network, when you're a political analyst for a cable network, you don't have time to punt. Yeah, this is very <laughs> effective training, so I appreciate the opportunity to practice. Josh Ernest, uh, quickly, quickly. 
There are a couple of <laughs> confounding variables that I think are worthy of consideration. The first is Secretary Clinton won the popular vote. Uh, and it's important not to <sighs> overlook that view, right? That's, it's easy to say, well, she got beat really badly. She lost the electoral vote. I'm not calling into question the results of the election. But we would also be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that she got more votes than the other guy. I think you're going to be from the Lewandowski is, school and not the Axelrod school. <laughs> uh, I'm not in my new job yet. I'm, I'm sticking <laughs> to the old job. Uh, one job at a time, uh, in the same way there's one president at a time. Uh, the second thing is, there are millions of people all across the country who voted for Barack Obama in 2008, who voted for Barack Obama in 2012, and then voted for Donald Trump in why 2016. Didn't they vote, why didn't those people vote for Hillary Clinton? I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that question is, particularly when you consider how aggressively President Obama weighed in, when you consider how popular President Obama is all across the country, not just with his longtime supporters, but with uh, Republicans and, uh, and independents as well, uh, comparatively. Uh, given the polarized nature of our country. So look, uh, there are a lot of questions to answer. There clearly are people uh, across the country who are fed up with dysfunction in Washington, D.C. And as much as I believe that that dysfunction should be laid at the feet of Republicans in Congress who refuse to do anything with Barack Obama, uh, even when he was uh, trying to promote ideas that they had origin originated, uh, clearly there are a lot of people across the country who laid uh, that dysfunction uh, at the feet of Democrats, too, including the Democratic president. Josh, you got... Uh, so... Sorry, didn't mean to ahead. cut you off. No, no so I think, I think that's, part of, <laughs> that's part of the answer, too, is what do we do to more effectively communicate uh, with those voters who I think unfairly uh, uh, held Democrats in Washington, including Barack Obama, responsible for some of that dysfunction? I don't think they should have, but it does raise questions about what Democrats are doing uh, to make a, a persuasive argument uh, to those people who voted for Barack Obama twice and, some, and for some reason uh, voted for Donald Trump.